Hey what's up guys, welcome to another video on IGCSC Biology Revision. Today we're going to be covering the topic of biotechnology and genetic engineering. And biotechnology is basically the exploitation of biological processes for certain industrial purposes. And genetic engineering involves the manipulation of certain microorganisms to produce certain products. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later, but first of all I want you to have a quick read through the syllabus and we'll begin the video. So in terms of manipulation of microorganisms, bacteria is quite good because it has a rapid reproduction rate and uh, the ability to make complex molecules makes it a, uh, a good uh, microorganism. The lack of ethical concerns regarding its manipulation and growth is also a plus and the genetic code is also shared with other organisms which is, which is really good. Um, the presence of plasmids also make it very useful and you'll We'll talk about that in a bit more detail towards the end of the video as well. In terms of biotechnology, we've got uh, yeast being involved in two main product, uh, two main processes. We've got biofuels, and we've also got bread making. So, important thing to note is that uh, under the absence of oxygen, the yeast will respire anaerobically, giving you this equation here, where you have glucose making ethanol, carbon dioxide, and energy. And you'll be aware that this becomes quite important. So. Again, for the specific production of ethanol, uh, in the absence of oxygen, you basically force the yeast to respire anaerobically, giving you this equation as above. And so you can add the yeast to a source of sugar and keep it in warm conditions, and the yeast will respire naturally, and uh, you'll produce ethanol, and that's called fermentation. And that ethanol, of course, can be used for biofuels. In bread making, you basically activate the yeast by mixing it with uh, sugar and water, and the mixture is then added to flour and that makes dough. The activated yeast will therefore uh, respire anaerobically and you, it'll give you carbon dioxide as the equation shows and the carbon dioxide then becomes trapped in the dough. When that happens the dough starts to rise. Uh, the temperature is important because respiration is controlled by enzymes, so you need to have or maintain an optimum temperature for that. So when the bread is fully cooked, the high temperatures will end up killing all the yeast and basically evaporate all the ethanol that was formed in the process, uh, leaving you with bread that has little holes in it, uh, and that's evidence of uh, the, the, the locations where the carbon dioxide was uh, trapped in the process. In fruit juice production, you have enzymes called pectinase that we use to break down peptin that you find in cell walls of plant cells. So pectinase is used to break down pectin in fruit cell walls so that uh, it becomes a lot easier to extract the juice from the fruit. In biological washing powders, you have enzymes in these washing powders that break down organic substances, making uh, the the uh, making certain stains go away a bit more easily. So the mainly the main enzymes that you'll find are proteases and enzymes and quite often you'll have to extract these specific enzymes from bacteria that live in fairly hot conditions because then because you need to use hot water with these washing powders you need to have the enzymes that don't denature uh, in these high temperatures and you'll quite often find these enzymes in, uh, in bacteria that live in hot conditions to begin with. Uh, in lactose-free or in the production of lactose-free milk, you have these fixed immobile enzymes uh, called lactase. And what you do is you uh, you've got these beads inside this tube, and you run milk that contains lactose through it. And what will happen is that lactase will digest all the lactose in the milk, and the following product will be lactose-free. Uh, this is pretty useful, uh, beads with lactase, because they can be used over and over again, so they're basically uh, reusable. Uh, in the production of penicillin, so penicillin is an antibiotic made by a fungus called penicillium. So what you do is you add penicillium with sugars and ammonium salt. The sugar will allow the penicillium to respire, and the ammonium is basically used as a... Um, were used by the penicillium to produce uh, protein and nucleic acids. Uh, so basically you mix all that together and use a fermenter for this and the main things about a fermenter is that it can sort of control and monitor the pH. It provides oxygen uh, so that the uh, microorganism or the fungus can respire and it has a cooling mechanism 
that can uh, maintain the culture at a certain temperature, so usually around 24 degrees, and the stirrer will keep the bacteria sp suspended in the culture. So what you have is all those things mixed together and you can sort of extract the penicillin, uh, so, sorry, the, the penicillin as the penicillium produces that in the culture. So genetic engineering is changing the genetic material of an organism by removing, changing, or inserting certain, uh, certain genes, right? So an example of this is in, uh, the insertion of human genes into bacteria uh, to produce insulin. So the insertion of genes into crop plants uh, can also give resistance uh, to herbicides and insect pests and insertions of genes into crop plants to also provide additional vitamins. All these things are examples of genetic engineering, but the main thing we'll be looking at is inserting our genes for insulin into bacteria to make insulin, right? So let's take a look. Bacteria can be made to produce insulin uh, by inserting the human insulin gene into the bacteria. So insulin is for diabetics. So the steps are as follows, right? So first of all, before we take a look at anything, I want you to take a look at this bacterial cell. You have the bacterial DNA, but what you also have are the circular genetic material that you'll also find. So this is really important uh, because the plasmids are a lot easier to take out and replace back into the bacteria. So we're going to be using plasmids for this process. So what you have is a normal healthy human cell that contains normal healthy insulin genes, right? So you select one of those and uh, you extract the chromosome from the healthy human cell. What you do is then you use a uh, restriction endonuclease enzyme, right, that comes along and cuts the insulin gene from the normal chromosome. So, you then select a suitable bacterial cell and extract a plasmid, which is this circular uh, structure here, from the DNA, uh, sorry, from the bacterial cell. When you remove the plasmid, what you'll do is use the same restriction endonuclease enzyme that you use to cut the normal human chromosome. That same, um, in, uh, that same enzyme will come along and cut a specific region of the plasmid. What you then do is insert the insulin gene that you extracted or cut off from the normal human uh, chromosome and you basically add it into the, uh, the, the plasmid. And you do that using a ligase enzyme. So this plasmid will then therefore have the, uh, the human insulin gene sort of in entered into the plasmid like so and you put that back into the bacteria and you put the bacteria in a fermenter so then the bacteria inside the fermenter will therefore start to produce human insulin and the insulin is then extracted and used for diabetics. Okay, so uh, this diagram here summarizes things pretty well uh, so have a quick look at that, uh, read through it again and everything should sort of make sense. I think the main thing is that uh, you use the same restriction endonuclease enzyme that you used to extract the human insulin gene from the human chromosome to also cut uh, the uh, plasmid so that we can insert it using the ligase enzyme, right? So that's all for today guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, please like and uh, subscribe if you, uh, if you like the video and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!